pleasure working with the team and seeing the, the progress that they've made over the past few weeks. Uh, it's been awesome. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to them to uh, show all of their hard work. Awesome. Thank you for those kind words, Alex. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is Brooks Robinson, and I'm part of the Home Network Defense team. Uh, we are very excited to share our final presentation with you. Um, as we all know, the amount of people working from remote environment has drastically increased uh, during the last year and a half. This has been a largely positive development, but it also means that remote users may be situated in a less secure environment at a greater risk to malicious attacks. Our product, which we decided to present under the name Swarm, or Shared Warning for Attack Response Management, extends Duke University's current threat intelligence feed, known as Stinger, to remote networks. We have a team of five Duke students led by two members of Duke OIT, Alex Merck and Nico Bailey, as well as our stakeholders from Duke OIT. Our team consists of myself, Sonia, Ace, Eric, and Connie. Our project was also sponsored by Cisco, so a big thank you to the folks at Cisco for their support and interest in our project. Next, Sonia will talk about our problem statement. Yeah, so really the goal of our project is to ultimately provide security that protects remote non-enterprise users from malicious traffic via the Stinger project. And that project uses data sharing of threat intelligence to benefit the higher ed community. And ACE is gonna go into more detail on Stinger specifically and how we plan to, and how we utilized it within our project. Thanks, Anya. Stinger stands for Shared Threat Intelligence for Network Gatekeeping and Automated Response. It's a project led by Duke University, and its goal is to protect the networks of high ed institutions against malicious traffic. Singer is a very large project. One aspect of it that we've been utilizing is the central intelligence feed, which hosts a list of constantly updating malicious IP addresses. Next, Sonia is going to dive into PFSense, the firewall program we've been using. Yeah, so PFSense is basically it's an open source operating system for routers and firewalls. So it provides that barrier between the, um, the IPN and the untrusted network. And we chose PFSense because it's a more targeted platform and secure and can run on a Raspberry Pi if the project goes in the hardware direction in the future. So overall PFSense offers more flexibility and it also includes an extension called PF Blocker NG. This allows us to build firewall rules based on both IPv4 and IPv6 address spaces. Now Eric's gonna go more into project requirements. Thanks, Sonia. We came up with a list of requirements we wanted to achieve and organize them into a total of six different categories. Tasks that the home network defense should be able to accomplish. First off, obtaining. The network should continuously pull information from Stingar and its honeypots, which includes statistics such as the attacker's IP addresses, um, the, the amount of times they attacked, and so on. We'll parse these addresses into a list readable by PFSense and feed them in, allowing us to block multiple IPs at a time. Furthermore, we should create a convenient experience for users by automating the previous, the previous processes with the help of Python scripts. Afterwards, we want to develop and design an accessible web interface. One that displays multiple statistics and tools geared towards assistance, allowing users to feel more confident and in control of what they're doing. Now, this is a technical diagram of Swarm. The information starts at the top left, where we pull raw IP indicators from the SIP database. Next, the admin slash global server, which is hosted on a public IP address, displays the IP block list that is to be fed to PF blocker NG as a firewall rule. The admin and co-admin UI also contains several interactive features by which they can provide, view, and even delete the permissions of certain users. With these rules in place, the PFSense-based software blocks malicious IP accesses from both inside and outside. The block stats from PFSense are fed into the user slash local server shown on the right. This server run directly through PFSense essentially provides the user with easy to read, interactive and graphical data relating to the Stinger block list and firewall blocks on the user's network. The purpose of this is to make the user feel more comfortable with what is going on in his or her network and to provide them with clear signs that the block list is indeed working. Next, Brooks will talk about our motivation behind Swarm's global server. Right, so now that you have a general idea of the layout of our project, I want to discuss the motivation behind the Swarm global server. 
In the beginning stages of our project, we first attempted to query the Stinger Central Intelligence Feed, or the SIF, uh, via the command line. The result of one such query is shown in the image to the right. As you can see, the query returned data that was not very friendly to parse through. Also, the PFSense plugin we used, PFBlockerNG, is fairly limited in how it accepts IP block lists. So as a team, we concluded that the best way to feed a block list into PFBlockerNG was to host a file online that contains the list of IP addresses. This decision led to the creation of the global server, which really tackles two issues at once. It hosts a constantly updating list of IP addresses that are then fed into PFBlockerNG, and it also provides an interface for administrators. We're about to see all of this in action, along with the local server hosting an individual's user statistics in the following demo. Here's the Swarm website, which contains the dangerous list of IP addresses that we gathered from Steer. The user would access this website using their individual authentication token, which you can see in the URL right here. On the PFSense side, a user would enter in that URL into the source, and then they would make sure that action says to my book, which makes sure that it denies in and outbound traffic to all of those IP addresses. I've already done this, so let's go to firewall rules, and you'll see that the swarm list is being blocked, and it's one of the firewall rules. If I hover over it, you can see all the IP addresses that are being blocked. To demonstrate that those IP addresses have been blocked, I'll go ahead and ping some IP addresses. First, I'll ping Google, which we are not blocking, and you'll see there's activity happening on each line. 64 bytes from 8.8.8.8. And then when we see the statistics, it says a package transmitted, a perceived, and 0% packet loss, which means that this IP address is not blocked from the network and there is activity happening. If we ping an IP address from the swarm list, so I'll ping the first one on the list, you'll notice that there's no 64 bytes from that IP address. There's no activity happening, nothing happening on the terminal. And you'll see it says 10 packets transmitted, but zero were received, and there's 100% packet loss. So that just means that the IP address is being blocked, and there's no activity happening when we try to access it, or if it tries to access our network. I'll go ahead and ping one more. I'll ping the second one. Once again, you'll see no activity is happening on the, in the terminal. There's no 64 bytes from the IP address. You'll see 11 packets have been transmitted, zero received, and 100% packet loss. So that IP address is being blocked. There's no activity if it tries to access our network or if we try to access that IP address. So as we can see, these IP addresses from our swarm list are being successfully blocked from the network. Welcome to the admin interface where we can generate random tokens for users. These randomly generated tokens are how we can access the full list of malicious IP addresses via inserting the token into the URL. So if we grab the token with this user and insert it into the URL via pasting it, then we can access the full list of malicious IP addresses from the central intelligence feed. Now, back to the admin interface, we have two main roles, head admins and co-admins. Both roles share the ability of adding users. So let's try adding this random user. description of delete. We can delete this random user by hitting the trash button. And we can edit existing information for users. Now, back to the point of having two roles, head admin and co-admins. Although both share this ability of adding and deleting users, only the head admin has the ability of adding and deleting co-admins. So when logged in as a co-admin, as opposed to a head admin, this manage co-admins button won't be visible. So let's try adding 
or a pull admin to the to the interface. The description of some program. Now that this co admin is added, let's go ahead and log in as a co admin. As you can see, we can still add and delete users, but we cannot access the co admin page. So here is our user server, which is hosted in the PFSense terminal and is accessible to users via login. Right now we can see the Stingar user login page. And once we actually log in, we can see sample data that displays malicious traffic stats regarding the user's network activity. At the top, we have the total number of attacks from the last day, last five days and month. Below that, there are tables featuring the top five most frequent attackers, from the last day, last five days and month. And in each table, the user can find the IPs that have been blocked, the last time stamp of an attack, the number of times that IP has attacked their network and what country that IP is coming from. While viewing the common attackers is helpful to know which IPs have been stronger threats, it's also helpful for users to simply view the recent attacks regardless of the frequency. So we have a recent attacks table that lists up to 100 of the most recent attackers. Here is a scroll bar feature implemented as well, so users are not overwhelmed by so much data at once. For the future, I would display even more attackers and develop a search bar for the recent attacks table so users could search for specific IPs quickly if they needed. Now I'll let Brooks go ahead and explain the rest of this network activity web page and its features. Our main goal when designing this statistics page was to provide data in an easy to read, understandable format for a non-technical user. We felt that data of a visual and graphical nature would complement the charts we've just seen, while also demonstrating the swarm is actually working correctly. The first chart you see here is a bar graph titled Top Countries by IP Blocks. In creating this graph, each IP address is first assigned its country in a key value pair. Then the number of times each country is represented is counted and a separate key value pair is created, where each country is associated with the number of times a unique IP address from that country has been blocked on the blacklist. From there, we feed the top 10 countries, or less if applicable, into this chart in alphabetical order. For instance, we can clearly see that 21 unique IP addresses have originated from the country of Moldova, by far the most of any country on this chart. The second chart displayed on the user statistics page is a line graph. Represented here is the number of blocks per day for the past five days. Uh, as an example, on August 4th, there were five total blocks, whereas July 31st, there were only two. Each graph comes with unique features that are included to make the user feel in control of the data. There are many different ways to interact with the data, including downloading the plot as a PNG image, zooming in and out, and comparing the data on hover. The user also has an ability to change their password. If they wish to do so, they must type in their new password after clicking this button. I will now demonstrate typing in the new password. Now you can see the passwords match. So once we hit save, we are redirected back to the original login page. We have to type in the new password. And we hit log in. And we're back to the original user statistics page. To summarize our project, we automated the process of pulling from Stinger and displaying the IP addresses to users. And we created an admin server and a user server. On the admin server, Admin can create and manage tokens for users, while on the user server, users can see statistics about their network traffic. And we've met the minimum project requirements. The next steps of our project would be to, to develop it into a commercial product. Since all of our team members are remote, we weren't able to test our project on physical hardware, such as a Raspberry Pi or some other type of router device. 
So testing on an actual router device would be a necessary feature task. Additionally, a pfSense ISO image file would need to be created, which would contain pfBlocker and the user server already on it. This would make the process of installation and setup for home users much easier. Lastly, the user server UI could include more statistics and functionalities such as a search bar to search a specific IP address and a display of the full list of attackers. Thank you all for taking time to listen to our presentation. Does anyone have any questions? You can raise your virtual hand or type it in the chat and we'll either call on you or just read it out loud. I don't know if you guys have seen the comments from John Herr in the chat. Sonia has answered. Great job, you guys. Why is Maldova <laughs> the site of many black hat hackers? Yeah, I think you'll have to get in touch with them to ask that. Uh, I think it's just purely their choice. Well, I hope yeah. maybe they'll maybe they'll intercept this and send me a, an answer. <laughs> this is the I think the only team that was 100% remote. So what kind of challenges did that present for you guys? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so like we already mentioned, um, it definitely would have been nice to to put it on an actual router and use some actual hardware. Um, and so because of that, that did create some challenges um, with this all being virtual. Um, so I feel like that was somewhat of a limitation to the project, but it means that there's um, a lot of pathways you can take this project in the future, which is definitely good news. Um, and I think that, you know, as far as organizationally as working as a team, I felt that all of us performed really well, uh, even though it was virtual. I mean, everyone was um, present every day and uh, everyone contributed in their own way. So I felt that the project went really well. Yeah, and I, just to add, I, I would say, even though we were on different time zones within the US, um, we always communicated a lot, even during the day. Um, and so the goals of what we were doing and communicating what we had executed throughout the day. So we weren't, no, you know, like doing work twice or we could help uh, other team members if they were struggling. So I think that helped too was we just had good communication. That's great. That's essential, especially when you're remote and in different time zones. Michael Corsio from Cisco has a question or comment. Yes, uh, a little bit of both. Um, first off, well done. Congratulations. Um, uh, the the project. Uh, I was very impressed with you know working working with all of you and how you were able to distill what's arguably a very complex uh, type of type of topic into an accessible way that uh, users could implement this in their in their home network ultimately. Um, and that's that's really what we're what we're going for. You know, protecting protecting users um, in their home networks and home resources um, from the wilds of the internet. I was kind of curious going going through, do you also have plans maybe for as one of the next steps to maybe providing uh, users, not just statistics about what uh, attacks are coming from the outside, but what might what also might be originating from within your home network, such as if you were demonstrating the ping test, is one of your home network devices trying to talk to Moldova for some unknown reason? Yeah, I think that's definitely something that the project could be uh, could be taken in that in that direction. Um, right now, there's not really anything testing for malware on the actual device, um, so I definitely think that there's a lot of potential for creating that feasibility as well. I don't know if someone else wants to add to that. Yeah, I think uh, there would be like a lot of features that we wanted to add to our project, but we're limited by the scope of the project or by the sure. time for the project. Yeah, of course. No, I, I think uh, definitely starting and, and at least having the information at your fingertips and then being able to, you know, leverage that into all, all sorts of uh, features for, for the users um, is excellent. Nice job. Well, so just thank you. Just to add mm -hmm. um, the stats page was we were using um, sample data, I believe. Um, Connie, just to clarify. 
Yeah, we were using simple. Theme. Yeah, so um, I, I was joking in the chat. I, uh, we can still give China and the US the title for greater <laughs> number of black hat hackers. Okay, but no, uh, de de definitely uh, excellent work. And um, th thanks for answering my question. So, thank you. Yeah, and I would just like to add uh, about the team, uh, this was not an easy project. So just the breadth and depth of information that the team had to digest in a relatively short period of time. So, um, you know, not only threat intelligence, uh, network security, firewalls, uh, web development, I was thoroughly impressed at, you know, how quickly they picked it up and, uh, produce something that is usable. Um, it is, it's been amazing watching that. To add into, to, to add on to that, yeah, the, the team I've, I've, you know, participated in Code Plus for, for the last couple of years now, and every year, you know, I'm super lucky to be part of a team that, that always has a lot of really good superstars. Um, this team here uh, is probably the first team I've had where I wouldn't call them superstars. I said, we got a team of superheroes here. Um, they, the work they've done, the learning that they've squeezed into this little bit of time, and then taking this project kind of above and beyond what we thought it was going to be, uh, you know, was just, it, it was amazing. I mean, they, you know, they did great work being in different time zones, being completely remote. And it just, you know, it, it really showed throughout the, the project, the complexity that they put into it and then turned around and, and kind of made it look super, super simple and easy. And, uh, it, you know, if anyone knows from any of my previous years in Code Plus and the teams that I've been on, we've always had fun names. And uh, this team, I would like to uh, announce to you all as the Avengers. <laughs> Uh, just just one comment as as part of the advisory sort of group uh, i thought you guys did a really good job of incorporating feedback from the outside as well uh you know we we had a number of sessions and it was it was quite uh nice to see the feedback incorporated uh very quickly and very professionally thank you yeah thank you